Right, 9.01, we will kick off. Well, good morning and welcome to today's webinar. For those who don't know me, my name is Caroline Stevenson and I head up the FinReg team here at Burnis Paul. Quick caveat, I have had this horrendous bug that's been going about, which means that I've not had a voice since Thursday evening and it's finally back today. It was touch and go whether I was going to be able to speak or not. But bear with me, if this goes, we'll just skip my part and we'll head straight into the other speakers. Um, just the usual housekeeping today. <clears throat> please do keep your um, cameras off, keep yourself on mute um, and um, the session will be recorded as usual and will be distributed um, after the event. So please do forward that on to anybody who may be interested. So on to today's webinar. Well, I am delighted to be joined by four wonderful speakers. They'll all introduce themselves before they kick off. So I'll not waste time doing that just now because we have got a lot to get through. Um, so settle down, get your coffee, and we'll get on with this. <clears throat> so as you know, we are currently two years into the FCA's three-year strategy. So we should all be aware of the direction of travel of the FCA and, and how they've been heading over the last couple of years. And so the good news is that the new business plan that was just released last week is familiar ter territory, and I don't think there's any big surprises. So we're going to take that, take you through the business plan today. So what will we be covering? Well, we will be going through this. So if you have a look at the overview, you can see we're going to briefly take you through the challenges of the year ahead. Um, and that's as seen through the, the lens of the FCA. We'll then go on to look at what the FCA is going to be focusing on in the next year. Jamie will then provide some budgetary insights because that's always an interesting place to look to see where, where they're sort of heading and where their priorities are. And then we'll take you through the FCA's commitments themselves, which is really the meat of the business plan. That's where all the detail is. Um, as you can see, we're going to allow some time for Q&A right at the end. So if you've got a burning question that comes up as we go through this, the webinar um, today, please do feel free to populate this in the chat and then we will answer any questions that pop up at the end of the session. So quite a lot to get through in an hour and hopefully my voice um, does stay with us for that full time, but let's see. Um, so anyway, what is the driver behind the FCA's proposed focus for this year? Well, as you might know, um, the FCA currently regulates around 50,000 firms in the UK. And as financial services regulator, the FCA has a key role in the success of the UK's financial services markets by striving to ensure that our sector is honest, competitive and fair. And I'm sure you can think of lots of initiatives over the last year um, kind of centred around those concepts and there's definitely more to come. So in order for the FCA to try and achieve this, it does set itself um, stretch objectives. And you can see from the slide that the current operational objective centre around three themes, protection, integrity and promotion. So the FCA's operational objectives are on the screen there to protect consumers, to protect the integrity of the UK financial system and also to promote effective competition in the interests of consumers. Well, that all makes sense. The FCA also has a post-Brexit secondary objective, which isn't on the slide, but this objective relates to facilitating international competitiveness of the UK economy. And we've actually seen examples of the FCA taking steps towards meeting that secondary objectives recently through initiatives such as the Burn Agreement. And if you joined us in our horizon scanning session in January, you'll know that we talked about the Burn Agreement and how exciting that is as a concept for the UK financial services sector. Um, if you did miss that webinar, then um, hop over to our YouTube channel at any time because all of our webinars are actually streamed on there um, and the Burn Agreement is included in January's Horizon Scanning webinar. So take a look at that. So back to today. Well, the strategy that I already mentioned um, sets out, basically sets out the blueprint um, for the FC on how they plan and achieve the objectives on the screen. And if you're familiar with the strategy, and you should be as we're two years into a three-year strategy, then you'll know that the FCA plans on doing this by reducing and preventing serious harm, by setting and testing higher standards, and by promoting competition and positive change. So that's the backdrop. These are all the themes that you'll see peppered throughout the business plan when we take you through the commitments in a, in a wee bit. Um, and everything that the FCA has done recently or plans to do links back to those objectives and areas of focus. So if that's the backdrop, what is the foreground? Well, 
as usual within the business plan, um, the FCA has set out the challenges they see for financial services firms having to face in the year ahead. Um, so before we delve into the areas of focus of the plan, we'll spend a couple of minutes or seconds, because we're not going to go into much detail, looking at those challenges. Um, a lot of these are self-explanatory because they affect each of us in our daily lives, but um, one of the challenges the FC identify is that higher interest rates and persistent inflation. We all know that inflation has fallen, but it still remains above the Bank of England's 2% target, so definitely a challenge. Um, the second challenge is global financial risks, such as high levels of public de debt in global and important econ economies and how that could affect UK stability. And then, as you can imagine, lots going on in the geopolitical space, which can affect things like shipping and trade and, and ultimately cause major disruptions, um, which could affect the UK's economy. So the FCA are mindful of all of these world events and, and other factors that does really impact our sector. And um, and and so uh, they're they're mindful that things might have to change and there might be have to make quite a, um, they might have to change things quite quickly. They might have to implement new initiatives where um, these challenges come to fruition throughout the year. <clears throat> Excuse me, time for some honey and lemon. <clears throat> so on to the focus for 24, 25, which is where we get to the real um, meat of, of the business plan effectively. Um, the the um, top areas of the focus here, which uh, are within the business plan should really seem familiar for you, to you because I've already mentioned them. It's the protection, integrity and promotion. So the three strategic ob objectives that I talked to earlier. But under those three and the three below, they, they basically these these are the kind of the basis of, of the FCA setting out their stall in the business plan. Um, and so they confirm that through these six areas of focus, there's a number of commitments they're going to make. And that is how the business plan is structured. Um, I'm going to touch on these briefly just to, to bring a bit of colour to what these mean in practice. But under protecting customers, uh, sorry, consumers, you can imagine that uh, consumer duty has to be featured. Um, but the FCA also confirmed that they are looking at some other specific means of protecting customers, for example, through looking at the advice received, checking the pensions product, deliver good value, and that consumers engage better with their products. These are all sort of themes that you can imagine have, have, have been at the fore for the last couple of years. Under the second one, market integrity, the FCA plans to continue to monitor markets and take appropriate action where required. You might be aware that um, capital markets as a whole within the UK, uh, there's been a huge project on this and it's about to go through um, some transformational change. So it's definitely one to watch and I'm really excited to see the proposed changes when they're released and also that ultimately the impact those changes will make on the UK economy and the financial sector. Um, under the competition limb, the FCA plan to look at how they can encourage competition to ensure the delivery of fair value outcomes and under the consumer duty. Now, this is something you'll be familiar with because the FCA has been committed to um, enhancing competition for years and they've looked at things in the past like the loyalty penalties. So I'm particularly interested in this one to see where the area of focus will take us next. In terms of international competitiveness, it's, it's really another exciting area of focus. Um, because the FCA really do want to improve the attractiveness and global reach of the UK wholesale market and also to encourage investment in the UK. And they want to do this by really creating a global hub for financial services developments. So under this area of focus, I suspect we'll see way more things like sandboxes, tech sprints and other developmental initiatives. But from a person's perspective, hopefully in addition to this, these kind of vast improvements, I really hope that the FCA kind of look upon themselves to improve themselves and so they can speed up matters such as authorizations and changing controls because we'll all know fine well that the delays to get some things done with the FCA can really have an impact on the growth investment and innovation in the sector so hopefully that's something that also comes uh, comes out of this and, and they do improve that um, and kind of I, I, Along with that theme is where the last two areas of focus are, are because they're more inward looking. So the FCA want to increase the engine room to 5,000 staff by the end of this month. So if you remember the stats I gave you before, this means that each staff member will only be responsible for 10 firms, if it was that simple. But effectively, they would have 5,000 staff for 50,000 firms. So they should be able to get things done efficiently and quickly. 
Um, and the FCA also plans on practicing what it preaches by investing in its own operational resilience. And operational resilience is definitely something we'll come on to later in this webinar. So you can see from that last two bullets and also kind of a little part of the, the, the third one prior, um, the FCA do plan to invest in themselves. So if they do plan to invest in themselves, Jamie, what else are they investing in? Let me pass over to you and you can give us some insights into the content of the FCA's budget. And let's do a little minor round of applause for my voice that held out. <laughs> God bless, honey. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Kath. So, yes, I thought it'd be worthwhile considering the FCA's budget for the year ahead before we get into the detail of the report, um, just as we did last year. And there are lots of priorities, but the budget itself can really help quantify the relative financial impact of the different changes and show some key trends. So if we can just uh, move on to the next slide. Um, the key elements of the budget are the cost of the FCA's core operating activities. That's the um, ongoing regulatory activity or ORA, uh, the largest element of which is people. And then you have the total amount the FCA charges the industry to fund its activities, which is the annual funding requirement. And first off, um, the FCA expects its annual funding requirement to rise by almost 11% to 755 million pounds, which signals the scale of the challenges it faces and uh, future workload is continuing to grow despite the continuity or apparent lack of change from the previous year's plan uh, for the most part. And that's up from 8.5% on the last year which was an increase of 4.3% on the previous year. So th th there's clearly a trend emerging. Um, a particularly big chunk of that is the growing remit and responsibilities under the smarter regulatory framework, no small part due to Brexit. That's attracting a whopping contribution of 11.3 million pounds and a growing workforce to help. To put that in perspective, that's bigger than the budget for the EU withdrawal in 2021-22, which was 10 million pounds. But both are obviously linked to the same underlying political process. I, th I think it's just telling that eight years after the vote, a lot of work still needs to be done. And secondly, uh, we've got the table at the bottom right, which is a, just a snip. The table is actually a lot bigger on, on, on the plan, but this is what's relevant to this discussion. Um, which is the base ORA budget is increasing by almost 10% on last year. And this includes new charges to reflect changes to the FCA's ongoing responsibilities for consumer duty and the financial promotions regime. So they weren't there in 2023, 24, because they were exceptional budget items. But this is showing, as the chart does above, that the ORA, uh, the ongoing regulatory activities uh, moves in step with the annual funding requirement as, as change beds in. Next slide, please. So let's find out what the FCA is focusing on. Of the FCA's 13 public commitments, the FCA's previous plan identified four as being the most critical last year. And this year, it has singled out fewer commitments of focus, just three. And those are the top three um, there, reducing and pre preventing financial crime, putting uh, consumers' needs first and strengthening the UK's position in global wholesale markets. As we will see, the missing commitment here is still important. That's the one on preparing financial services for the future, which I think Caroline might talk to in a little bit. Um, and given what I've already said about the chunky budget for the smarter regulatory framework, firms will still need to ensure adequate resourcing and governance for in-flight regulatory change programmes, despite that apparent uh, downgrading. And we've got various speakers today from the team to talk to the different commitments. But first, I'm going to talk to the first commitment, uh, which is reducing and preventing financial crime. So first, the outcomes. The FCA wants to achieve a clear focus on slowing the growth of investment fraud and APP fraud. And these words are carefully chosen um, it's worth just dwelling on the point that slowing the growth uh, is not the same as reducing, and it's still expected that incidents will continue to grow. They just won't grow as quickly. Um, and I think there's probably good reason for that, because a lot of this is beyond the FCA's control alone. 
Um, it does, however, want to reduce money laundering through directly supervised firms, uh, of which there are around 51,000. So it, 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 in areas where it has direct control and responsibility, it's, it's taking uh, what it's, it's seeking to take significant uh, proactive stance. Next slide, please. So the FCA in its key activities, it, it has split this up in, in the business plan between uh, key ongoing activities from the last year and key new activities. Um, and it's also got a description around what it's been doing. And it's noted that significant milestones were reached in the last year with the publication of two national strategic documents, um, which were private public partnership documents, um, the economic crime plan in March, 2023, and the fraud strategy in May 2023. And more recently, the FCA published an update report on uh, reducing and preventing financial crime on the 8th of February to provide a midpoint summary against its three-year strategy. That's not something that uh, was, was called out specifically, but um, I think it's really uh, quite important for context because it does add flesh to the bones and quite current flesh to the bones on what steps the FCA is likely to focus on. And in that, it summarizes four focus areas ahead uh, for the next 18 months, namely data and technology, uh, further collaboration, consumer awareness, and measuring effectiveness. And throughout this and, and the two national strategic documents, the prevailing theme is public-private partnership, and it sets out suggested actions for firms too. So the economic crime plan uh, was for 2023 to 2026, and that focuses on money laundering, combating kleptocracy and sanctions evasion, and cutting fraud. Although, as we'll come on to, there is the fraud strategy too. And it emphasizes multi-stakeholder approach for public-private partnerships to strengthen the UK's response to financial crime. Um, and as one of several supporting stakeholders, the FCA has been allocated a number of actions around crypto assets in particular, um, and there are delivery dates uh, for the second quarter and the fourth quarter this year on those items. On fraud strategy, fraud is by far the most common crime in the UK and accounts for over 40% of all offences in England and Wales. In Scotland, fraud was recently reported to reach its highest ever levels with cases doubling to nearly 50 a day. The FCA's approach to fraud involves a partnership strategy again, aligning its objectives with those of regulated firms. It sees mutual benefit in fraud prevention with these firms, and it aims to drive collaboration across the industry with the law enforcement agencies. Now, despite only being published last week, there are some who have already been openly critical of the business plan, saying that it lacks a proactive stance on fraud and whether it goes far enough to make the UK an attractive, or sorry, an unattractive jurisdiction for anyone to commit fraud. Again, I think it just helps to view the FCA's approach as part of the national strategy. In that light, the FCA is just one of many delivery partners and the strategy is very proactive and centered on pursuing fraudsters, blocking fraudsters and empowering the public. So just to take some examples, the fraud strategy highlights the government's online fraud charter, which ensures that all advertisers of financial promotions are cross-referenced against the FCA authorized list before being public. Google has seen close to a 100% reduction in paid for scam advertising for financial services products since using the FCA's list. Payment service providers will be enabled to adopt a new risk-based approach to prove additional time for potentially fraudulent payments to be investigated. And it's said that the FCA will undertake assessments of financial firms, fraud systems and controls. Tackling APP fraud continues to be a priority for the FCA and they will proactively consider a range of potential policy initiatives to tackle the scale and impacts uh, that are associated with that type of crime, both for victims and regulated firms. But the payment systems regulator also has an important role to play to support the mandatory reimbursement of APP fraud coming into effect in October this year. And the FCA is also working with both the Treasury and the payment systems regulator on the legislative and regulatory change necessary to enable firms to slow payments where they suspect fraud, um, which could be quite a big development. So given the rapidly 
growing and complex threat that fraud poses, it's clearly important that there is a whole system response, um, which also explains why, why the, the, the outcome they're hoping to achieve is to slow the growth rather, rather than eradicate. From the FCA's perspective, the key activity to start this year is to increase investment in systems to use intelligence and data more effectively within its financial crime work so that it can target higher risk firms and activities. It will take assertive action to tackle scams and fraudulent websites. And it's also uh, expected to use its powers through the Office for Professional Body Anti-Money Laundering Supervision, known as OPBAS, to improve standards in the legal and accountancy sectors too. So all in all, this continues to be a challenging commitment and a collaborative effort. There are targeted actions towards enhancing enforcement capabilities, closing vulnerabilities associated with crypto assets and strengthening technological capabilities too. And these efforts together are geared towards curtailing the current growth rates. So there's lots for AML compliance and product development teams to mull over. Um, it's likely in my view that financial crime risks will continue to be uh, part of the next cycle of the business plan too. Next slide, please. So I think I'll hand you over to Lindsay now for, for the second commitment. Great, thanks, Jamie. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay and I'm a senior associate in the FinReg team. Um, I'm gonna take us through commitment two and commitment three. Um, so starting with commitment two, um, it's putting consumer needs first. Um, as you'd likely anticipate, this commitment and the terminology very much aligns with consumer duty, um, which is applied in relation to open books from the 31st of July last year and will apply in relation to closed books from July uh, this year. Um, so in relation to this commitment, the FCA has reiterated the significant focus on good outcomes and the consideration to be given to the diverse needs of consumers. Um, that includes those with characteristics of vulnerability. Um, I'll come on to vulnerability in a little bit more detail shortly, but just to mention now, um, it's referenced a couple of times throughout the plan and in this section, so definitely seems to be an area um, of increased focus. So using this commitment, the FCA has made it clear that they're going to focus their interventions where there's greatest risk of harm and where more work is needed by firms to identify and address gaps to meet the higher standards of the duty. Um, the FCA has also used this commitment um, to set out its responses to a couple of different areas, including the cost of living pressures, financial inclusion, access to cash, and addressing consumer difficulties um, in accessing the products and services that they need. Um, so as with the other um, kind of three, I guess, headline commitments, this one's organised into the outcomes the FCA wants to achieve the key activities that are starting in 2024 and 2025 and those activities that they're already doing and will continue. I won't read through all of these objectives, it's quite a wordy slide here, um, but the terminology and expectations will be familiar to many of you um, and include firms demonstrating the good kind of good faith, avoiding foreseeable harm, um, and that consumers are sold products that meet their needs and objectives, a price that represents fair value, which we know is subjective, um, but specifically referenced is that poor value products should be improved or removed. Um, and this is probably likely particularly relevant for closed books. Um, so turning now to the key activities that are starting for 2024 and 2025, these are, yep, set out in the next slide. Um, so you'll notice there are vulnerabilities mentioned in both of those key activities. Um, the first is in relation to multi-firm work and market studies. Um, so specifically referenced here, um, I guess as a bit of a heads up or warning for unit linked pensions and long term saving product providers um, who can expect to form part of that multi firm work and market studies. Um, that will include testing the transparency of charges across the value chains. <clears throat> and the FCA will also consider how firms assess the product value and their response where they identify unfair value. So clearly a couple of different steps there to carry out the assessments, um, identify relevant actions and take them. Um, we'll see there the work also focuses on how swiftly the insurance industry responds to claims, including where customers are more likely to show characteristics of vulnerability. 
the second key activity there um, is a really broad one um, and it's just reviewing firms treatment of customers in vulnerable circumstances so I think that'll have much wider um, application. The, there's quite a lot of activity already happening in this space which I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with um, so probably worth going through that um, to you know, just to refresh on the, the implications for each firm. But just briefly as a reminder, there's a couple of things to highlight. So ongoing supervisory work will test firms implementation of consumer duty um, and improve firms delivery of the good customer outcomes. This will include complaints handling, root cause analysis, consumer support journeys, consumer understanding, fair value and closed products and services. So, so clearly those points, you know, coming through a number of times. Um, and I think it would be a particularly good idea to make sure all of those are covered in the Consumer Duty Board report, um, which needs to be carried out within a year of the 31st of July, 2023. So if it hasn't been done yet, that'll be in the next couple of months. Um, and yeah, definitely a couple of um, tips in there to make sure those, those points are um, included. Um, finally, just one other point to highlight is the work that's ongoing from the FCA to ensure that consumers with savings receive a fair deal and are kept informed of the better rates. Um, and, you know, so client inertia um, isn't kind of leaving them in poorly performing um, accounts. So turning now to commitment three, um, this one is strengthening the UK's position in global wholesale markets. So the FCA wants the UK to continue to strengthen its position in global wholesale markets and also to host markets which support the domestic economy and growth. Um, specifically, this is markets which are open to innovation and underpinned by high standards of market integrity and investor protection. And some of the points that Caroline mentioned earlier, um, the, you know, the kind of different initiatives, innovation, sandbox, that kind of thing um, are mentioned as part of this commitment. So there's really ambitious objectives as part of this commitment, which can be seen on the slide. Um, you know, the UK being viewed as one of the top markets of choice, innovation is encouraged and regulation is evolving. Um, action is expected by firms to remediate quickly while there are, when there are failings, um, albeit it's supposed to be, um, you know, an environment of innovation um, being encouraged. So the key activities in this slide, there's already a lot of work being undertaken in relation to this commitment. So there's just one key activity which is starting this year, uh, which is shown on the next slide. Thank you. And that's in relation to innovation, um, maybe unsurprisingly, because it's been mentioned a few times so far, but supporting the work to move to a T plus one settlement to increase efficiency and, you know, presumably also to um, improve good customer outcomes um, with speeding things up. So for that one, we expect work will be carried out with relevant firms um, to work towards that T plus one settlement. Um, I mentioned already there's a lot of ongoing activities in this area. Um, I won't go through them all, but they're kind of structured or organized into those three areas that are identified on the slide. So updating the regulatory framework, encourage and support innovation involving markets and improving our own performance. And that's the FCA's um, performance. So just taking each one briefly, updating the regulatory framework um, that includes includes a lot of delivery this year. Um, and that's true for the second one as well, actually. So in relation to updating the regulatory framework, it's a focus on delivery of policy reforms to primary market um, and concluding the FCA's review of the listing regime and publishing proposals for a new public offer and admission to trading regime. Um, ensuring venues are able to deal with and remain resilient in extreme events. Um, a consultation is expected in relation to proposals for commodity positions limits regime. Um, so again, kind of resilience being mentioned there, which will um, be mentioned, I think, later in the, in the presentation. Um, another one for 2024 is the FCA ensuring that derivative markets are ready to implement the new reporting rules um, under the UK European Market Infrastructure Regulation or UK EMIR um, and that will be in September 2024 um, to help ensure the orderly transition away from LIBOR. Um, moving to the encourage and support innovation and evolving markets, again quite a lot of activity expected in 2024. Um, so the digital securities sandbox will be open to applications um, during this year and that's supporting the work of the Bank of England on the Treasury's objective um, to create the sandbox. 
um, they'll also be working with the Treasury to meet the government's objective um, of launching an intermittent trading platform, so Pisces or private intermittent share and capital exchange, and that's also by the end of 2024. Um, and finally, also in 2024, the FCA will confirm final rules for the overseas fund regime um, and the application's gateway for modernizing the operations, the authorizations processes. Um, and finally, in relation to improving the FCA's performance, um, we've kind of mentioned already um, the increased capacity of you know, staffing levels. Um, so that will be done through <clears throat> capability and capacity with people, technology and data um, to predict and make them more responsive to heightened market volatility and events in global markets. So there's that reference there to data. Um, and we've already seen quite a lot about the FCA um, increasing the, the data requirements and being data led and using that to um, focus and drive some of their activities. <clears throat> Um, and finally, to improve market integrity through increased expertise, capacity and capabilities to carry out monitoring of fixed income and commodities and continuously improving how they authorise funds, firms and improve people, approved people. Um, so that was touching on your point um, earlier, Caroline. So hopefully we might see um, some improvements and efficiencies there. Um, I'll pass back, I think, on to commitment four. Thanks, Lindsay. And um, so now that the three that um, that Lindsay and Jamie have just taken you through are sort of three key ones, and they're set out in the business plan differently to commitments four to thirteen. Because as you'll see, there's sort of um, outcomes that they want to achieve, plus the ongoing work and key activities towards achieving those commitments. Whereas um, commitments four to thirteen. There is much less detail and the reason that is my view is because these are sort of more ongoing commitments. It's things that's already commenced and, and the FCA are just setting out the, the, the pieces of work that they're continuing to do in that and in, in, under that heading. So if we move on to the first one, um, commitment four is preparing financial services for the future. Now, we have touched on this in a, a little bit earlier, but this should be um, familiar um, for you all. Um, in terms of um, the preparing financials for the services for the future, there's a few there's there's been ongoing work in this for a long time, and I think some of the key things to understand in relation to this one is that there's recently been a uh, um a change in terminology, um in terms of um the what we're used to understanding as the future regulatory framework has now changed terminology and it's now going to be known as the smarter regulatory framework. Um, in, in addition to this, uh, what we formerly know and as retained, retained EU law is no longer going to be called retained EU law, it's now called assimilated law. So that's something that you should bear in mind because it, I think it can get quite confusing if you because you might think that these are different initiatives but actually they're not, they're the same. And so we've been we've been um, quite familiar with the concept of building this new regulatory framework for a while now. Um, and just this week or last or late last week, the HM, uh, HM Treasury um, released a document, which is a really good snapshot into the progress that they've made to um, to replace the assimilated law. It's called it's a document you can find on their website It's called Building a Smarter Financial Services Regulatory Framework for the UK. Um, and within that document, it shows how good progress is being made towards the financial services sector for the future within the UK. Um, and as part of Brexit work, HM Treasury and the team uh, behind behind this piece of work identified 777 pieces of assimilated law um, that they required to replace. And in the progress update, they've stated that at the end of February this year, 44% of those have been repealed through FISMA 2023, which is effectively the piece of legislation that helps us do that. Um, in number, that equates to 344 regulations. Um, and you should be familiar with some of the things that's already happened where um, Treasury has changed, has kind of made or laid regulations to or instruments to replace those assimilated laws, such as like things around solvency to prospective regulation, securitization. So um, there's lots going on in that space. Um, and so at base, I think in terms of the future reg framework, I think the best thing to do is keep an eye on the HM Treasury portal. There's there's a section within that which really sets out all of the detail of what needs to um, 
of what they're doing and, and the work that's ongoing in that place. So that's just going to be your best um, place for tools. Um, I'm going to pass over to Lorna now to talk to Commitment 5. Thanks very much, Caroline. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lorna Stephen. I'm an associate in the FinReg team. Um, and as has already been mentioned, for Apologies, just managed to mute myself. Uh, for the following commitments, there is less kind of in terms of new initiatives, because this is really more of the, the ongoing work the FCA sees and continuing into the, the coming years. So they've not really given a lot away on uh, dealing with problem firms. But they have said that they will continue to proactively detect and take action against problem firms and individuals. Part of this is quickly identifying and where necessary cancelling um, those firms don't meet the threshold conditions. So just in terms of what did they say last time um, in the last business plan on this point, the FCA said it wanted consumers and market participants to have confidence that firms which fail to meet the threshold conditions or otherwise shouldn't be regulated are identified and dealt with and overall to improve the trust that consumers and market participants have in the FCA that it will step up, step up and step in to stop harm quickly. The FCA said last year that it would use its additional resource um, to increase the number of firms it takes action against. Um, so, so one example of this kind of looking to the last year and, and going forward, I'm sure everyone will be aware of the FCA's use it or lose it initiative. Um, the FCA is proactively removing permissions from firms where these haven't been used in the last 12 months following a warning letter. Um, you also see from the, the FCA news updates, there have been almost 100 firms who've had permissions removed due to a failure to carry on regulated activities since the start of this year. And this doesn't show any signs of slowing down over the coming year. Uh, so whilst not using permissions isn't the most active harm in the market, being authorised whilst not using permissions may mislead consumers about the level of protection offered by a firm or give credibility to a firm's non-regulated activities. Um, the FCA has also confirmed that over the course of the next year, they intend to identify any barriers in the regulatory framework which might constrain their ability to take action. Um, the FCA has been saying for some time now that it intends to take a more assertive approach to enforcement, and, and this appears to be much more of the same. So whilst there are certainly a number of other commitments in the business plan for the year ahead, we could see a potential review of the Decision Procedure and Penalties Manual or the FCA's Enforcement Guide, as well as wider changes to the regulatory landscape in support of this objective. So that's everything on problem firms. I'll now hand you over to Marianne. Thanks, Lorna. Um, and good morning, everyone. I'm Marianne. I'm a senior solicitor in the FinReg team. Um, so another one of the FCA's key commitments is to take assertive action on market abuse. And this has been one of the regulator's key, key priorities in order to increase confidence in the integrity of the UK market. So the FCA set out in this year's business plan that it intends to significantly increase its capacity to tackle market abuse within a proportionate framework that supports innovation. And the FCA has included numerous examples of its ongoing work in this area, some of which are included on the slide. So firstly, the FCA will increase its ability to tackle market abuse and particularly its detection of cross-asset class market abuse. It plans to build on its advanced analytics capabilities, such as network analysis and cross-asset class visualizations. And it will, in particular, develop improved market monitoring and intervention in fixed income commodities and markets, covering both market abuse and market integrity. The FCA said that it plans to issue a discussion paper on transferring the MIFID's data reporting regimes for transactions and reference data under regulatory technical standards 22 and 23. The FCA also plans to increase its resources and capability to influence international markets data strategy, signifying its ambitions to remain a key player on the global stage. The SC is also stated in the business plan that it will implement a market abuse regime for cryptocurrencies within the current year. So last year, the UK government consulted on its proposal to establish a tailored market abuse regime specifically designed for crypto assets. 
And in response to the consultation, the government confirmed that it intends to introduce market abuse offences, which will be applicable to all individuals involved in market manipulation of crypto assets listed on UK trading venues. This expansion of regulatory oversight demonstrates um, the FCA's commitment to curbing market manipulation and fraudulent practices in the digital asset space. And finally, the FCA will publish revised market cleanliness data in Q3 of this year, which will capture more anomalous trading compared to its existing metrics. It also plans to publish the results of its peer review of markets abuse systems and controls in providers of direct market access. I'll pass you back over to Lorna for a Commitment 7. Thanks very much, Marianne. Um, so I've spoken already about the FCA's approach to problem firms for the year ahead, but they've also committed to reducing harm from firm failure, which we can see on the slide. The FCA's aim here is to minimise the adverse impact of firm failure on consumers and markets. The FCA also plans to continue supporting the industry by sharing relevant information about from its data, the new financial resilience return and the FCA's everyday work. So I'm conscious that we are very much coming up against time and we still have quite a few commitments to come through. So I will try and be brief on this one. Um, so the FCA Financial Resilience Survey was replaced with a new Financial Resilience Regulatory Return um, from the beginning of this year. The policy statement, which was issued last May, confirmed that the data they had been gathering under the old survey had allowed the FCA to rapidly assess financial resilience risks in firms resulting in early intervention where appropriate. And so the decision was taken to convert this into a formal return, which would give the FCA access to high quality baseline financial resilience information from approximately 23,000 firms on a permanent basis. So I think in the year ahead, we will be seeing them using the information that they've been gathering from the, the now more formal return um, and using that to inform the decisions that they make. And I will pass you back to Marianne for some ESG. Thanks, Lorna. <clears throat> so back in uh, 2021, DSA published its paper detailing its ESG, environmental, social and governance priorities for positive change in financial services. So it's no surprise that the next commitment is in respect of ESG, which remains a key feature. Not much has changed since that initial paper. The FCA still hopes to support the financial sector in driving positive change, including the transition to net zero. Recently, we've already seen the FCA deliver a lot in the ESG space, um, including in relation to sustainability disclosure requirements and anti-greenwashing, but the FCA has stated that it plans to continue its ongoing work this year. The FCA plans to integrate the sustainability disclosure requirements and investment labels across the market, including the anti-greenwashing rule and guidance. So as a reminder, the FCA published the final rules for its sustainability disclosure requirements, SDR regime in November last year, and policy statement MPS 2316. The policy statement introduced a new set of rules aimed at tackling greenwashing, including investment product sustainability labels, and restrictions on how terms like ESG, green and sustainable can be used. Now that the FCA rules are finalised, the FCA says it plans to integrate them across the market, including the anti-greenwashing rule, which will require all FCA authorised firms to ensure that sustainability related claims made about financial products or services are fair, clear, clear and not misleading and consistent with the sustainability profile of the product or service. And this rule and its um, supplementary guidance will come into force from the 31st of May this year. The FCA also plans to expand the current SDR regime. So in a departure from what was originally proposed at consultation stage, the FCA decided not to include discretionary portfolio managers within the scope of the SDR rules. The FCA therefore plans to initiate a separate consultation during the course of this year on proposals concerning portfolio management. And finally, the FCA continues to engage on new and emerging risks with UK and international partners. It will be progressing its work on transition finance and preparing to have regard to 
and nature regulatory principle, um, which will come into force. It's not entirely clear yet what this new principle will involve, but um, it could definitely be an interesting one to watch. Uh, so back over to you, Lorna, for the next two commitments. Thank you. So as technology continues to transform the way the financial sector operates, the SEA has confirmed it needs to manage the risks to capture the significant benefits available to consumers and markets. So the SEA hasn't specified any new initiatives that it intends to pursue in this space over the coming year, but it does intend to continue working with stakeholders to assess the impact of AI on UK markets, and it plans to publish the outcome of its call for input on data asymmetry between big tech firms and other financial services firms. The outcome is due to be published in Q2 this year, uh, so keep your eyes peeled for that one coming out later. Um, so whilst it wasn't specifically trailed in the, the business plan, the FCA is continuing to promote good outcomes for consumers with its updated guidance published yesterday for firms and influencers to keep their social media ads lawful. The FCA recognises that social media has become a central part of firms' marketing strategies, and so it's important that these adverts issued on social media must be fair, clear and not misleading, as it has been heard a number of times. But this means that they should be balanced and they should contain the right risk warnings so that consumers can make well-informed financial decisions. Um, the guidance covers the promotion of financial services via the medium of real memes, reels and gaming streams um, and includes examples of compliant and non-compliant ads to illustrate the points. It, it's possibly one of the most colourful pieces of guidance I've seen from the SCA, um, but genuinely I think the worked examples are, are helpful uh, to those who will be reviewing it and making sure that they comply. And then if we move on to the next slide, I'll talk about the redress framework. So the SCA wants to ensure that consumers receive appropriate and efficient redress for things go wrong and that claims management companies deliver fair value and the firms that cause harm and um, bear more the cost of redress. The SCA will also continue its work on the advice guidance boundary review. So as, as part of the Edinburgh forums announced at the end of 2022, the SCA and the government said they would commence a joint review to examine the regulatory boundary between financial advice and other forms of support. Following the discussion paper published on the topic last December and the closure of the feedback period at the end of February, the output is expected later this year. And as you'll see from the slide, the SCA has committed to continuing its work on historic discretionary commission arrangements in the motor finance market. So in January, the SCA launched its review and put a pause on the eight-week deadline for motor finance firms to provide a final response to complaints that relate to these discretionary commission arrangements. Um, whilst these were banned in 2021, due to a couple of false cases, the SCA wanted to have a period of time to analyse the issues and work out if any further legal steps need to be taken for historic practices. Um, and so they wanted to, firms to stop reviewing live complaints in the meantime. Um, the nine month pause that was implemented is due to end in September this year, um, and the FCA plans to set out next steps on the issue in Q3. So again, one to watch coming down the track. And I will hand back over to Marianne. Thanks, Lorna. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll try and race through the next two commitments. So commitment 11 is heavily focused on financial promotions. The business plan points out that technological developments are making it easier and faster than ever to engage in financial services activity. But consumers aren't always provided with the information required to make good decisions. So as Lorna mentioned, you might have seen that the FCA have already made inroads against this commitment yesterday when they issued new guidance clamping down on financial influencers or finfluencers. Other work under this commitment will involve the FCA continuing its robust assessment of firms' applications to approve financial promotions for unauthorised firms. As of February this year, authorised firms need permission from the FCA if they want to approve promotions for unregulated persons. And the FCA's register now includes information about firms' permissions to approve promotions. Also, using new sources of data, the FCA will act quickly against authorised firms approving and issuing non-compliant financial promotions and unauthorised firms whose activity could lead to mis-selling and financial losses. It's evident from the business plan that the FCA remains committed to regulating crypto asset marketing activities. 
The FCA set out that it will continue its supervision of crypto asset firms' financial promotions, increase its technological capability to detect harmful financial promotions, and develop campaigns such as its Scam, Part, its Scam Smart campaign, which aims to protect potential investors from investment fraud. Further, the FCA plans to continue to engage with social media platforms and search engines where appropriate. It, moving on, so the Online Safety Act received royal assent in October of last year, and the new legislation places duties on search engines and social media sites to put in place proportionate systems and processes to manage the risks to users from illegal content on their sites. The new act will largely focus on issues of child protection and terrorism, but it will also include illegal financial promotions within its scope. So Ofcom, the communications regulator, will oversee the new regime. However, the FCA has been working closely with them to establish a shared understanding of how platforms' obligations under the Online Safety Act interact with financial promotions legislation. And the FCA has stated in the business plan that it will continue its work with Ofcom to successfully implement the legislation for financial services. And then finally, um, just on this slide, the FCA will publish a response following last year's advice guidance boundary review discussion paper. So this was a joint FCA and government review to examine the regulatory boundary between financial advice and other forms of support. And the response will set out options for future legislative and regulatory reform to enable customers have access to the help and guidance that they need at a cost they can afford. So just moving on now to commitment 12, which is the last in my section. This is um, another important commitment of the FCAs, um, which is to minimise the impact of operational disruptions as it strives to ensure that the UK's financial sector is as resilient as possible. So the business plan points out that firms still face a high and growing level of cyber threat threats and operational resilience risks against a complex geopolitical backdrop. We're also seeing increasing levels of systemic risk build up in the system due to reliance on critical third parties. If you've been keeping an eye on European developments, then you'll know the most recent piece of operational resilience legislation that was implemented in January was the Digital Operational Resilience Act, or DORA for short. This was introduced just in response to a growing reliance on information and communication technology systems in the financial sector. So the focus on this is not just by the UK regulator. Um, if you want to hear more about DORA, then do check out the Insights part of our website where you'll find our article which explains DORA and its applicability to UK firms in more detail. So going back to the UK, the FCA's ongoing work in this area this year will be to continue to deal with firms that cannot meet the FCA standards on operational resilience. So from 31st of March 2025, all relevant firms will need to maintain their important business services without intolerable harm to consumers and markets. So this ser it serves as a timely reminder that by the March 25 deadline, firms are expected to have performed mapping and testing so that they can remain within impact tolerances for each important business service and make the necessary investments to enable them to operate consistently within their impact tolerance. Um, the FCA also plans to publish a consultation paper clarifying its expectations and how firms should report operational incidents to them. And this will help to ensure that the FCA and firms are responding effectively to minimise harm to consumers and markets. And finally, um, the FCA, along with the Bank of England and PRA, published a consultation paper seeking views on how it should oversee the resilience of services third parties provide. Um, and the consultation closed recently in March and the critical third party oversight framework is expected to be in place later in 2024. So back over to Lorna quickly, who will touch on the final commitment. Yes, so the final commitment is not a new one, absolutely improve, improving oversight of appointed representatives. So I'll, I'll just very briefly touch on this one. As I'm sure you'll all be aware, the concern has really been centered around principals not adequately overseeing the actions of their appointed representatives. And this potentially puts consumers at risk and can also undermine market integrity. So very, very briefly, the FCA intends to continue its use of data in the space. It can, 
wants to continue scrutinizing principal firms at the point they appoint appointed representatives and then continue assertive supervision throughout the relationship with appropriate enforcement action. So I think that's all I will say on that one. And that brings us to the end of the main part of our presentation. Um, but we have left a little bit of time for questions and I can see we've actually got a couple in the chat already. Um, so the first one we have here is, what have you seen so far on the SCA's review of private market evaluation processes? Shall I take that one? Go for it. So, I mean, that's a very topical question because I think just last week the FCA told uh, investment companies at the AIC that it's going to revisit, um, it's going to visit fund managers this year to probe their valuation practices for private equity and unquoted assets. Um, they, it, it's talk of picking different firms across the ecosystem and they're also going to ask about governance and some of the practices that they employ uh, with a view uh, potentially to having some kind of outcome statement of that activity across firms um, at the end of the year, possibly in the form of a thematic review. Um, it could just be highlights of good and bad practices. Um, what's telling is, uh, is that any significant change on that front, um, so rules or guidance, um, probably won't be made until next year, uh, which explains why there's very little on it in the business plan. Um, but in the meantime, obviously, firms are encouraged to to make sure that their approaches to valuation are, are, are robust and and um, industry best practice in the meantime. Thanks, Jamie. I think the second question is in relation to diversity and inclusion. So um, S. Dobbs, sorry, I'm, I don't know your name, where does the work on diversity and inclusion fit into the FCA's commitments? So that's a really good question, because actually, if you looked at the business plan, it, does, it isn't actually really covered there at all. But I think the D&I D is so integral and in the work that the FCA is doing is so integral to the way that financial services firms function, that it, it kind of is a, a it kind of is a thread, a common thread throughout each of the commitments. However, I think if we were to slot it in, it's probably more fits into the preparing financial services firms for the future um, because um, it, there's going to be so many changes that are coming in um, in relation to that, particularly around the non-financial misconduct, which we're awaiting the, the kind of post-consultation um, guidance on. Um, we've actually, it's actually, we could, this could have actually been a plan, could it, Jamie? Because we do actually have a series of employment um, related sort of fs related employment webinars and events coming up um very soon so keep your eyes peeled for that but we will be covering this in more detail in terms of what to expect and, and what firms need to do to comply <clears throat> the question from david thompson lindsay i'm not sure if you're able to answer this one because i know that you talked t plus one in your presentation but if not jamie might you be able to jump in but David has asked, is there any time scale for the UK and Europe moving to T plus one? Um, so, so in the business plan, it's more like the supporting the work towards it. So there's no particular time frame um, given. So it feels like relatively early stages um, as far as can be seen from the business plan anyway. I think that's right. So that, hopefully that was helpful. And um, that I think draws us to a close. I don't see any uh, more questions. Um, this session has been recorded and will be circulated, so please do share it with anyone who might be interested afterwards. We'll be back again in May for sure, when we're expecting the updated version of the regulatory initiatives grid, which may shed some more light on that T plus one question and others. Um, and Marianne mentioned DORA and the article we recently uploaded, um, but it's worth having a look at the website because there's plenty more content on there and much more to come. And if you've got any other questions that you, you thought about but didn't have the chance to ask, please do get in touch directly because we, we'd love to help. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks. Have a good morning.